So, um, obviously tonight we'll finish up um, 14 R6. I only have like maybe like 10, 15 minutes at most to finish this up. And then um, we'll transition over to talking about S4. And then Stone has graciously taken on the responsibilities to present that. So uh, once I get finished, then we'll, we'll uh, transition over to Stone and then we'll go from there. So um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's just dive right in here to our back into R6. And so to kind of, oh, I gotta share my screen here real quick. Uh, zoom, zoom, share my screen. That's not one, share. All right, cool. So this is what we were talking about last time. Just as like a quick, quick review, I wanted to kind of bring up that we talked about this opportunity where we were using like active fields and private fields. And we were using that kind of exercise example of using a bank account um, or creating an R6 class bank account and then going through and like working through it. And I kind of shared some examples of where we might, you know, use a private field like an account number because once you get an account number you don't really want to overwrite that account number and so then i think rob you mentioned um or ron you mentioned um you know another good example of this would be maybe creating a balance private field because we don't want anything outside of our class object to necessarily change that that field unless it was a method from that class that changed it. So we were kind of talking through that example. Right, and I thought that'd be a good place to have an accessor, an active binding for that one. I mean, so that you can only read it, you couldn't write to it, you can only write to it by doing a proper deposit or whatever, right? Yep, exactly. And so I thought that was a, a really good point and I was kind of going through and thinking about that. Um, I didn't make the change because I didn't have time to make the change. I, notes, I but... get that. <laughs> but we were kind of talking about that and so, um, kind of where we were left off, we were talking a little bit about like, how does an active field work? I shared kind of my mental model of how I think things are working. Again, I don't necessarily, um, no, Siri, I don't need you. Um, kind of talking about, you know, thinking about how this works. Again, I don't know if this is 100% correct, but again, the main thing to think about is that R6 really kind of leverages the use of environments to keep things organized and so um and how you reference certain things you have to do certain syntax conventions so that you can access objects and references in these specific environments and so we were talking about that and that comes up again in our conversation of s4 and and reading ahead it, it comes up again in in the trade-offs discussion so where we where we were getting into was this idea of reference semantics and how R6 follows reference semantics, which is different from other objects in R. And really it's this idea that we talked about this idea of copy on modify. And with objects in R, in most cases, it will follow a copy on modify behavior. But when it comes to R6 objects, it follows reference semantics. And so there's some consequences that are the result of this. And so we have to kind of keep these in mind because they may not necessarily be like completely obvious until we uh, see them in action. And so the book kind of talks about these different consequences of this reference semantics caused by R6, R, that R6 uses. Yeah. Um, so it does talk about if you do want to copy an R6 object, you have to use this method called clone I didn't share this example, but it's in the book, but basically you just call this method anytime that you want to make a copy. Uh, there's some other less obvious questions, which the next few sections kind of dive into, but, and I might have to kind of get some further clarification from the group on this, because I wasn't fully sure on all of these consequences or if I got them correct, but the first kind of consequence of this is that um, using, having rep or R6, using reference semantics, it makes it harder for us to reason about code that uses R6 objects because we need more context to figure out what's actually happening. And then the other thing is to think about, is to also think about like when an R6 object is deleted because there's complements to the initialized method that being finalized. And so there are some discussions about uh, date, like using or creating a class that when it, 
when an object gets deleted, it removes that connection between a database. And so it was talking about that a little bit. And then um, one of the fields was created inside initialize. Oh, so there was some other discussion about like, if you are going to have, um, if you're, if you are going to create kind of that database connection, you have to make sure that you write it, those fields and initialize. Otherwise it's going to be the same like object. I think it was, but I have to kind of dig in that one here a second. Cause that one was a little bit confusing for me. So the first kind of idea is this idea that one of the consequences of R6 and reference semantics is it's harder to reason about code. And so in the book, it shares this example of like, here we have two list objects containing just two values, you know, A and B. And when we pass this into a function, we know that, um, that the final line only modifies Z. But if we rely on our six objects that have specific methods, we don't necessarily know what this method is doing in the background. We need more context to know what it's changing. And so it could be changing a value within that method or not in that method, but maybe changing a field within that object that we don't necessarily know about. And so my thinking was, and I was a little, I didn't really fully understand this example and, and, and the group might need to fill me in on this, but I, is this a limitation of abstraction? Like we're taking away the complexity by using R6 or we're, we're abstracting out that complexity, but because we're extracting, you know, abstracting that out, we don't necessarily have like a clear picture of like everything that's changing when we use that R6 class. Is my thinking right? Or am I like not thinking of that correctly? Abstraction doesn't, I, in my opinion, I would say that abstraction is an orth, not orthogonal, but not necessarily, doesn't necessarily imply this problem is going to occur. It's really a problem with the reference semantics. That's the real course of this, source of this problem, right? That you can you can have something, you can do something, and then you don't get any, you don't uh, you don't know what side effects is ha are happening in, in, behind the scenes, and those side effects can change each time you call the function, right? So that's odd, right? So that's why this side effect free or functional style that R has is easier to reason about because you don't you know that nothing weird is happening behind the scene usually except for some special functions that like read or write files or do something like that. You can generally rely on when you call the function with the same arguments, you get the same answer, right? Again, unless you have like a random number generator in there or a file being read or something like that. But those are cases where you can isolate, right? And you usually do you isolate those a little bit. Or you can yeah. set a seed for the random number generator, then you even, even then you can be sure you get the same results back. But, but when you use these R6 objects with the reference semantics, um, there is, a, I guess there is a part of this has to do with the encapsulation that some things are hidden from you, but some of those things that are hidden are also changing, which is. Yeah. Yeah, in this case, I think it's, so the, I think in the example is because like X and Y are R6 objects. Um, so the, so the function f in this case can, um, because it passes in the reference, you can right. change x on the outside, even though like it might not seem like x is changing, it might, um, but it can change x. Whereas in the uh, like typical R version, because x is now a copy of the x inside the function is now a copy of x. So no matter what happens, you cannot change the outside x. That makes sense. Mm. Okay. Um, I think. Mm. Yeah. So, like, um, so, and like, if you're not passing R6 objects, no matter what happens when you're inside the function, if you're modifying X, that is a new X, right? It, it copies it immediately. So, therefore, like, the only way to modify the outside X is to, like, either R globally, like, you don't put it, pass it as an. Uh, function R globally like picks it up, which is you know bad R um, uh, functionality, or you use like the super assignment operator where it purposely goes out to get it. So there are are ways to modify it outside, um, but typically you wouldn't write R like that. Whereas in like, and it's it would hard be hard to um, you would you would see that that was happening inside the function, whereas. The f function, you could have it call methods on x, and then 
that code is hidden somewhere else and that code might be modifying X itself and you wouldn't know it unless you're like digging, like you're stepping through every single step. Um, hmm. And then, yeah, I think in general, one thing with like abstraction is that it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't reduce the complexity of things. It just hides the complexity and maybe that is useful for certain things or not useful for certain things, but like, you know, if you trust the people who wrote the 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 R six object to like not do anything weird, then it's like okay, perfect. You hide all the details, I'll figure it out. But it, like, um, but like like in this case, right? You don't know if it's modifying or not. If that's important, then you have to go and step through everything. And then in, in that case, I find the abstraction makes it harder, right? Because you're like, well, now I have to find where the function, the R6 objects defined and where the methods mm -hmm. defined. It's not right there in the function anymore. So I have to like go dig through all these files. Um, mm. So that's kind of like where I see a lot of the like trade-offs there for R6 R or just like this object oriented stuff in general is, is like, um, it's not necessarily as obvious like where, where code is being called. Yeah, maybe that makes this sense. Is, this is oh, why recently, on. I just think maybe this is why recently OOP has kind of been on the downtrend and functional has been on the uptrend. There's been just a tons of excitement. I think about more functional languages in general, or even like functional Python and functional JavaScript. And, and R has yeah. been there all along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Like, you know the idea that you were saying stone of like you have to like walk through it like to fully know what's actually happening you know like you have to that class you don't necessarily know what's happening and so you'd have to walk through it to figure it out you know unlike a functional style you know you don't necessarily have to do all those steps you can actually kind of see it without having to you know yeah. go through all that complexity so so it's a trade-off, right? It's a trade-off. You have to try. You have to trust that people are are writing their uh, their classes and methods correctly, or else you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. So that's interesting. Um, so the other thing that it talks a little bit about is, you know, you can kind of get a better sense of this with the idea of using like a finalizer. Um, so when you think about, since our six objects are not copied on modified, they are only so they are only deleted once, right? And so we can kind of use this characteristic to complement the initialize with like kind of like a finalized method. And so the way I think of this is like, you can have, you can set up a class so that when an object is created and then uh, gotten rid of, it like cleans up after itself. And so a good example of this would be like, say you have like a database co you know, connection and you don't want to keep that database. You have a program that's running and you don't want to keep that database connection open indefinitely, you can write an R6 class to, um, to on finalize. Well, first it's, this one's talking about like a temporary file, but the, the next example we'll talk about with it, like a database connection, but like you can write this initialize where it's setting up like this temporary path. And then once this object is removed, then once this object is removed, then it will just clean up after itself and get rid of this path connection. And so, um, and again, to be a little bit more specific, the book kind of talks about this isn't necessarily when it's deleted, it's when it's garbage collected. So like, if you want to be very specific, it's, hey, when this object is garbage collected, then that connection will be closed or that link will be closed. And so um, I'm not necessarily sure how this pertain to reference semantics, but I mean, if somebody wants to add to that, I didn't necessarily, I understand like the concept and the utility of it, but I didn't necessarily understand like how this represents like the, a consequence of reference semantics, but that just could be that I just don't completely understand it just yet. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you necessarily need reference semantics for, I guess, I guess it's because like with that R6 object, there's only essentially one copy of it at all times. Um, so, um, yeah, honestly, I'm not 100% sure. This definitely feels like 
something sort of tangential toward it, towards it, I guess. Yeah. I, I mean, that's where I just got cut off. I was like, I was like, I don't necessarily understand how this is a consequence of reference semantics, but I mean, I guess you could say like it is just there is one object, like there's only one database object or one connection or one object that has that connection. Yeah. And then because it gets deleted, then it like, you know, garbage collects and then there's no other like connection out there, I guess is the way I'm thinking of it. But yeah, I mean, the in terms of like wanting to have an R6 for a like external connection, I think that, I mean, that makes sense, right? Cause you only, you tip, you only have, you want to share the connection between objects or whatever. And then that way, like, there's no way to accidentally copy the connection, like, um, object essentially. So like, no matter what, like when you close the connection object, it is a hundred percent closed. Nobody else can use it. Um, so I think that makes sense to have an R6, but I'm not a hundred percent sure why you need to finalize, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I think I, I think, think they're just saying it, it's it's something it does exist that you can use. You'll you, mm -hmm. you, there is a well defined concept of when the object goes out of scope or sorry gets gets garbage collected, and at that point, if there's any if the if when you created the object, it opened files or it did something, created some kind of uh, resource, used some kind of resource, or you connected to a, a database somewhere, right? You want to make sure that when that object is not used anymore that it properly closes things and, and the rest of that, right? So that part I get, unlike in some languages, though, I don't know if that happens at a well-defined time, right? I mean, like in C++, there's like, you know, object gets, goes out of scope. That's why I said that, I, it goes out of scope. It's garbage, it's a, it would be immediately call it a deleter or whatever, um, or finalizer. But um, here, I'm not sure when that garbage collection happens, right? It's because, kind of whenever yeah. art decides it should happen right <laughs> that's not what yeah. the book says it's like don't rely on this like rely on yeah. like art does what it wants to do when it garbage so i think blocks. this would be like an emergency i mean you should probably have like a close method for your object so you call the close method so it closes connections closes the files whatever but you could also put this in a finalizer just to make sure that if the person forgot they don't they, they have a good chance that maybe the, the the database is still in a good state or the file got flushed or whatever right so mm -hmm. I wouldn't rely on it, yeah, for sure. So then the other thing that it talks about is some like other consequences. Um, you know, if you use an R6 class as the default value of a field, it will be shared across all instances or instances of the object. And so really the whole thing about this is like in the context of like this idea of creating a database connection, you want to make sure that if you are creating this connection that you put this connection object into your initialize as well or else when you create objects it's going to be the same path and so all I really took from this was just this idea of like hey if you're going to do this make sure that you have it your connection object that you're that you're creating and referencing is put in the initialize because then every time you create a new object there are different paths right because you don't want two paths for the same object so I don't necessarily think there was anything beyond this outside of just like hey know that if you are going to be creating a new object you want to make sure that you have your initialize method set up correctly so you're not creating like a copy of the same like path so uh and then the last thing because uh i don't want to take any more of stone's time here but um you know why use r6 here's just some of the points the book had you know it's the book says it's it's, it's similar to RC or reference classes. And then, so it asks the question, well then, if it's similar, why should we use R6 over RC? Um, one, R6 is simpler, excuse me, because RC is gonna require us to understand S4, which we're gonna talk about. There's comprehensive documentation, which I shared with everybody last time. R6 is a package in itself. It has documentation associated with it. Uh, this one I think is kind of really important. The idea that there's simpler me me mechanisms for cross package subclassing, which just works. So because R6 relies on environments and environments reference their parents and one, one parent is the global environment, um, you can also access other classes and create subclasses from other classes and other packages um, for your classes as well. So it just makes it easier and it's easier to work with. Um, you can separate your public and private fields in those separate environments. 
Uh, when it comes to RC, it stacks everything in the same environment, which we'll talk about in two weeks when we talk about trade-offs. If optimization is important to you, R6 is faster. There is a vignette in the documentation that does the benchmarking for you to show you that it is faster. And then with RC, RC is tied to R itself. So if, they, if you need any um, bug fixes that require a new R version, that may not be best for your users because not all of your users are going to be using the latest version of R. And so, you know, if you're creating a package that's going to allow people to use older versions of R, um, you can rely more on R6 than RC because it's not, because R6 is not attached to um, like the newer version of R. And then um, R6 and RC are similar. So if you do need RC at the end of the day, it's, probably pretty easy to pick up because you now understand these concepts in relation to R6 and they're fairly similar. So, so that's our conversation of R6. Um, does anybody want to add anything? Additional questions, comments, things that I missed? Nothing from me? No, I think you got it covered pretty good. Cool. And my, my favorite thing is when I was reading the trade-off chapter, it was like, hey, maybe not use this. I'm just like, great. <laughs> <laughs> now that I know all of this. But anyways, so cool. All right. Well, I am going to stop sharing and I'll turn it over to you, Stone, to start talking about S4. Sounds good. And... I'm running this through the browser, so it's a little a little slow. No worries. Um, so, yeah, can I see this okay? Make sure I, okay. Um, yeah, so S4, um, basically a lot like everything else, but just with a lot more formality. Um, so this is the notes that other people did. Um, I honestly find the examples they did kind of confusing. So I kind of did a, another example at the bottom. Um, and I think it might be good to just sort of quickly go over the main components and not necessarily focus too much on the syntax, um, just because it is just sort of fiddly. Um, and sort of just go over some of the, I think, more of the big picture stuff. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, basically S4 objects have slots and they have methods um, and very similar to S3 and R6, um, if you consider like a list having slots. Um, and the main difference is sort of like this formality. So to define a class, you use set class, you give it a name, say it's just person. The slots, um, uh, you have to specify which type it is. So in this case, name is a type of character, age is a type of numeric. And then to create a instance of the class, um, you would do new, use this new operator, uh, new function, so new person. And then you can specify which of the slots you want to um, fill in uh, on creation. So in this case, name is John Smith, age is NA real. And this creates a new object. Um, so then if you did like, um, so the way to access the uh, slots, use at symbols. Um, so John at name would return John Smith and John at age would return numeric. So that's one of the bigger differences um, is that instead of say like a dollar sign, you're using these at symbols um, instead. Um, and then so similarly to how like the print um, generic worked in S3, you can also create your own generics in um, S4. So in this case, it's saying, okay, age is now a new generic function. Um, and then you have to use this syntax here. So you say function X standard generic age. Um, and then here they're creating another function as well. So it's a assignment um, function. So now you can assign to um, age. And then the same sort of syntax here, where this is like a special magic syntax that you have to use. 
So this creates the generic, but um, now we want to specify that we have a uh, age that works on the person class. So that we use set method age person. Um, and then the function X. Um, so X here is now like you have the object. So in other languages, this would be like self or in R6, this would be self. Um, and then, so now X at age. So this acts as the slot and returns the age value. Um, in this case, it's, it's setting the age value here. So X at age value and then return the X, right? So here we can set the age of John to 50. And then when we see the age, it is 50. Um, yes, okay. Um, so yeah, so in this case, this is saying, okay, well now we have a class called employee. Um, it contains person. So this is the, um, this is creating a subclass of person. So, um, and then we're adding a new slot called boss, which is also of type of person. Um, and then the prototype option, all this does, it, it lets you um, create default values. So the default value is now a new person. Um, so yeah, one of the things I found confusing is like, okay, this is actually the only essential part for creating a, a subclass. So if I did set class employee contains person, and then I did new employee employee, then my new employee would have at age, at name, and then also an at boss, which is another person object. Um, any questions so far? I think it might be easier if I just show the R markdown actually and just run the code. Just give me, give me a second. I think the thing that gets confusing to me is that idea of like the slots, like when we're creating a subclass, right? I totally understand. The contains mm -hmm. is what does the in inheritance, but I guess like the slots boss equals person is what kind of confuses me a little bit about how, and then this might just be a syntax thing, but it's like, I'm, and maybe my mental model of S4 is a little off, but like the idea of thinking of like slots are fields, they're just yeah. a different name. Yeah. But then like, why are we bringing in this like person? Right. So, so in this case, um, remember how this is the, the type of the thing? So now we're saying boss is a type person and person is the original class we had we created. That makes sense. Okay, because in my mind, I was thinking that you were just going back to that super class and you were adding a new slot or a new, and I'm gonna use the term field, but you're adding like a new slot, but that's not what you're doing. It's just that you need to add boss equals person to the slots, not because you're adding a new field to the super class, right? Uh, right, so this this defines, um, so this is saying that my new class employee inherits all the slots of person, right here. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry if I switch between Macs and Windows all day, so I'm just very, <laughs> I never, uh, <laughs> The hockeys always get messed up. Yeah, um, same. So new employee. Um, so right. Uh, so so even though I didn't find the slots here, um, my employee class has a slot called name and a slot called age. So. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah. And then I might want to add a. Uh, oops, I say slots equals um, uh, hourly pay equals numeric. So now if I, oopsie, do this class, um, new employee. So now it gets the hourly pay, the name, and a, uh, a slot called age. So now I have a new slot here. And that's only defined under my cl employee class. Hmm. Um, 
So then if I do boss equals person, uh, now I have a slot called boss and the type is an object of class person. Hmm. So I, and then the the prototype says I can define a default value, right? So prototype C, um, and then let's say hourly pay equals in dollars, um, and then boss equals new. So I'm forcing it to create a new person. And then we'll say the name equals default boss. I think this should work. So now we see a slot boss of object person. And now this also has a slot of name called default boss. Hmm. So it's basically saying you can, the slots can literally be anything. It can be numeric, character, or other, other classes as well. Hmm. Okay, that um, makes sense. Cool. Um, yeah, I think that was basically it. Um, so they're saying just for like good um, syntax or good form, I guess, it's like you want to create a, uh, typically want to create a function that calls new for the user. So they don't, they're not the ones directly calling you. Um, and one reason you might do this is if you had like very um, unfriendly slot names, you might want to have like a more friendly version that fills in the slot name essentially. But yeah, it's just like a, a wrapper around or, or here they're doing like checks for, okay, make sure age is a double um, for whatever reason. Um, oh yeah. So for validation, it checks the type of um. So so the person object right is. Oh, well, I'm just gonna rewrite. So this one is calling saying name is of empty cars, because we defined names originally to have character type. It now checks to make sure that the name is a type character, and if you if it's not, then you get an error essentially. Um, but it doesn't check anything else. So even though we only expect the age to be a single value, because it is numeric, then age has now successfully been set as 30 and 70. Uh, to get around this, there's a function called um, set validity. So you set the validity, you give it the class name, and then you give it a function. Um, so object or self in the R6 sense, um, in this case, if you're doing R6. And then here you can do the checks. Um, so it's basically saying, okay, make sure name and the length of age are the same, so the only one. Um, otherwise, return true. Um, so now this will prevent you from, on, on creation, it'll prevent, um, It'll run this check, and if this check is not true, then um, it'll fail. But you can still modify it afterwards uh, after creation. So it's never, um, this check only happens when you make a new object. If I made an object called Hadley, then set age to numeric values, then it would still let me do that. Yeah, the one thing that I, I was questioning about, like the set validity, is like, what if you had more slots that you wanted to like check or validate, right? Do you just yeah. keep adding to this or do you just do like a completely separate like set validity or do you like say you I wanted to do multiple checks? How would you do that? I feel like you put it all in here. Um, let's see. I feel, yeah, I feel like if you did something like um, object age, equals 
page. This will just override it. I'm not sure though. It's a good question. I was just wondering that because I was sitting there thinking about like when you do this in like a package structure, like say you had multiple slots that you wanted to validate, like do you just do like a big like do you just do all your conditionals inside of the set validity, or do you just like make multiple ones? Was like my question. Um, I, I I feel like you have to set it in mul in the same one because I feel like this will just overwrite. The validity check. Um, actually, I just realized this wouldn't. Yeah. And it could be just because I'm not as familiar. I like I'm not familiar with like packages implementing S four, and I probably should have done a little bit of homework in in the back end of it. But that was like the question I had when look when I was reading through it was that was. How would you implement that? And like, if you had multiple checks, yeah, I, I think you have to. I, I think you have to do it in the same set validity because it overwrites it. So, um, so yeah, you would just. I think you would just keep going. So you'd just be like, um, yeah, you have to do like multiple checks and then return true at the very end. I guess if they're all true of all your checks. That seems kind of that seems kind of interesting because it's like that seems like it could get pretty long. I mean, it depends on how many slots you have, I guess. And you yeah. probably should be doing subclassing if you had a lot of different like slots or something like that, because not every slot needs to be a part of a superclass. So I guess it's just a des our design decision. But yeah, I so I think yeah. So when you check the validity of this object, I think um the validity of like all your super classes is also checked at the same time or not, not the same time but they also check all your the validity of, above it as well um so if you're like doing subclasses you don't have to worry about like rewriting all the slots all of the checks hmm. that's kind of nice but i am not 100 percent sure yeah because i get what you mean now because like if i did multiple checks here if some are true and some are false then i have to like and them all together at the very end, which might be kind of annoying. But yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So add modification. This is basically saying similar with R6. If you change the, if you change how the uh, class is written, um, I don't even know this is. So I'm not, this one is even the same example. Um, if you change how the class is written, um, you can ch all your methods might not work because it might be referring to slots that have been redefined. Um, so generic. Yeah, so a bunch of generics like show, which is like the print version. Um, Accessing slots. Okay. Check period. Yeah, so I guess you can write um, a different function to check the validity of things. Yeah, so I guess this is kind of what you're saying, right? They're checking all the stuff, the length of all the object year, month, day, year, making sure they're all the right length, and then finally returning true if it is a true, or errors if it um, if there's issues with the uh, um, creation of the object, I guess. So this was the example from the previous cohort? Yeah, yeah. I think this is from Luberdate. Um, this is like a Luberdate code. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, because there was a question about Luberdate. I think that there was like a uh, an exercise with that. Oh, uh, I see, I see. Yeah, so I think if you cram this into, so they define this as a function, but I think if you set the validity and use this function inside your validity function, they might have done it somewhere else. So if you did like um, set validity, um, I don't know what the object's called. 
whatever period. And then the function was like check period, whatever this class name is. I think this would work. Uh -oh. oh, I see. Cause you're just building the infrastructure outside of it. You're like, yeah. I'm going to create a separate function that checks, you know, does all my validity checks or my, you know, validates my inputs or validates my slots. Sorry, I keep mixing up language here, but because um, okay. <laughs> like, I got R6 on my mind and then now it's like S4 and then so, but anyways, it's like, it's validating your slot values, but then you're like building your separate like function outside of it to which then you get passed into set validity to do all of your checks. So yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And yeah, see here, they're like building a bunch of error messages. And then if the length is zero, so no errors, then true. Otherwise, return all your error messages. I guess from like a design perspective, like, like if something errors out in this entire thing, like where, like, what does the, like, 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 what would the user get? Like, how would they know what to fix? You know, unless there was like, I guess yeah. errors returns everything, like all the errors that were within it. So, yeah. So, so errors is like is a a vector of characters, or yeah, vector of error messages. So, so they're basically like, okay, check every single length, and then if there's an error, build a vector that's saying um, which either month, day, hour, minute, or second, or a lot of them, more than one then return this as a vector of values. Hmm. So uh, in this case, it would return inconsistent lengths. So if year, day, and second were the wrong length, then it would say inconsistent length year equals, and then report the length that it got, and then it would print it all out. Hmm. Yeah, so here it's building the message and then pasting it all together, or seeing it all together into one vector that's an error messages, and then printing it out at the very end, if there's an error. Maybe I should have ran an example. Okay. Um, Okay, in this case, I'm going to jump down to one I put together. Um, so this is more of like a classical thing you would see, like video game sort of stuff. So we're going to create a class called entity. Um, and then the slots, right? I want to, if you imagine like it's a game object of some sort. So I want to know the location, the velocity, if it's moving, um, if it's active or not. So, you know, if it's a, a live or a dead object. Um, the prototype sets a default value, so I initialize everything at um, 0, 0, 0, set it's active true, and velocity is also 0. Um, this is another thing that was interesting is like uh, there's actually a validity option um, when you're creating the class. So when you're create, doing the set class, though, I think one of the things in the advanced R thing is they're saying that the style between what's considered like good style now and what is allowed in the original S4 has diverged. So this is another way you can do validity, but I guess set validity is considered like a better style now. Um, yeah. So in this case, we create an entity object. Um, so now I have a, so if I wanted to create a new entity, so new entity equals, um, new entity and I'm just going to set the location to be some oops so now if I look at the new entity what I expect so location slot a velocity slot an active slot and the location slot is one um, so the other thing I'm going to do is create a class called a movement updater. Um, and basically, all this does is like, um, if I want to update a bunch of objects, a bunch of entities at one time, um, I can 
uh, create this movement updater, and that'll tell you how I should change the movement for an object. Um, so if I want to like move all the objects to the right or the left or up or down, then um, I'm using this to sort of define the movement, um, how I should change movements. So I've created a movement updater. So delta location, delta velocity, and then prototype is okay. So the defaults is zero, so it doesn't move anything. Um, So in this case, I'm also going to create a um, set validity uh, function just to make sure that you know I'm not adding extra values. So that, imagine that this is x, y, and z values um, for velocity or location, so like a 3D object. Um, so then here I'm creating a new movement updater, and I'm saying, OK, I'm going to change location of the x by one, and then increase the velocity of y by one. Um, here, I'm creating a method called for the plus operator. So basically, now I can, the idea is now I can sort of create, I want to be able to do my entity plus the movement operator so that I can update my entity's location. Um, so in this case, I'm doing set method of the plus symbol. Um, so the signature here is saying, OK, what are the two types of your objects? So my first object must be of type entity, and my second object must be of type movement updater. And then I create my function. So in this case, I'm updating entity one's location with its original location plus the delta location for the movement updater. And then velocity. Um, and the velocity is updated in the same way. Um, so create a new entity. And then, so my original entity um, has location 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then I've updated its location. Uh, one of the things about this annoying about S4 is that it depends. So the slots really determine how, which, how the function gets called. So in this case, because the first object is an entity and the second object is a movement updater, this function works. But um, oh, I, I, didn't know, I don't know if I deleted. Oh, crap. Um, give me a second. Basically, that shouldn't have worked because uh, I didn't define a method where the first slot is movement updater and the second one is entity. But it did because I actually already did that. Um, let, me, let me just rerun all this real quick. OK. Sorry about this. Run this. Uh, and this hopefully will fail. I don't know why that's not failing. Uh, typically, that should fail. <laughs> um, but yeah, so typically, this should be like very sensitive to like which, um, which the order of these things are. So, like, the dispatch of what method to use depends on what the type is and the ordering of the type as well. Plus might be special in that it might look, it might try both, both orders since it's supposed to be commutative. I don't know. Um, it's I just a wild it, guess. <laughs> I, I feel like it has to be something I messed up. <laughs> Did it fail before when you tried it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. And and I, my I think my made up answers. <laughs> no, I mean, that would, be, that would be really nice. Um, because you can imagine that you wouldn't want it to be commutative, right? If you that's true, like special re special types of. In fact, in this particular case, right, you have a special yeah. meaning for plus. Yeah. So, like, if you had like, um, you had like matrix multiplication, you wanted to find it. Uh, here we go. Yeah. So in this case, we get the error. So non-numeric argument to binary operator, um, which is basically saying that. It doesn't know how to dispatch this properly, right? Um, because the the it sees the first object is this move updater, and the second one is the entity, and it's like, oh, 
I don't have a method to find, so I'm going to throw an error. Um, so now here, if I define it such that the first slot is movement updater and the second slot is entity, now this should work. And hopefully it does. Yep, there you go. So it's kind of like the fiddly bits with like S4 is you have to go through and define all these all, all these. Um, Yeah. And yeah, this is just like a subclassing example. So now I have like a new slot I'm going to call hunger. And then the prototype is just going to be um, a list with hunger equals zero. Oops, I think this, I think this actually needs to be, oh yeah, no, this is correct. And then this also contains entity. So now all my predator entities will also have location and I can set the update or whatever. Um, yeah, and I think the other interesting thing is so like this is pretty tedious, but um, you can actually do like a set method called a riff, and this will for any like plus minus subtraction operator you can like call um, you can call the like default method. Um, so this like will intercept any plus or minus or anything like that. Um, yeah. That's kind of all I had. It's kind of a whirlwind tour. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me show. That's, for... That's a pretty good job of a whirlwind tour for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's. I don't know how much I'd ever use S4 because here's my thinking. <laughs> Number one. The book recommends S3 for most things anyway, right? Number yeah. two, I'm not part of the bioconductor community. I don't plan on it. And number three, S7 is uh, coming, right? Which is- Yeah, R R7? S7? It's going to be called S7 now. So, <laughs> so there's more like an S type thing than an R type. Yeah, thing. yeah. So- Yeah. Go ahead, S7, and S7 is supposed to improve on R7, I think. There is, like Hadley did a talk. I, I watched it, but I only like, only somewhat internalized it because I didn't really Same. fully understand. Yeah. yeah didn't I didn't fully know. understand how S4 was. And I know I want to rewatch it now after reading this chapter. And... I mean, I just like the thing about it is it's just like seems like there's just like and I understand why it just seems like it's really verbose like you just have to do so yeah. many things and like I yeah. get like you want that structure like if it's a big project but I'm like big project like, yeah I'm just like this is just too many steps like you have to do like like you have to do all of your set stuff you have to create accessors and all this I'm like I mean, I'm looking at like just one, I'm looking at like one file in Luberdate, like for, for periods. Cause you, you mentioned that example and I was like th yeah. looking through it, like just one, like S4, like setup is like 697. Well, this is including Roxygen like stuff too. So I shouldn't be harping on it too much, but it's like 697, like lines of code, just like set up. So it's probably yeah. like 300 lines of code just to like set up one class. And I'm just like, that seems like a lot of work. So yeah. But, and for what game? I mean, like, I guess, I you, you know. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's for big projects where there's a lot of people working on it and requires some discipline um, beyond what you normally would have, I would think. I mean, this is one of the things I always hated about object-oriented programs, to treat this kind of fiddly bits. I mean, like with the early days with like Microsoft foundation classes and all that, it was just a big hot mass of hierarchies and, and yeah. Oh, just, yeah. Well, and I think people are getting away from that now. They're, they're talking, you know, people are saying, don't use a lot of hierarchies, don't use a lot of this. And yeah. I mean, look at languages like Rust and, Julia and things, they don't even support most of these things anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, well, I think the, go ahead, go ahead. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, because I was, because I was looking at like examples of the S4, and I think the matrix Patrick, matrix Patrick package one at least makes the most sense, I feel like, because like, you know, a 
symmetric matrix is a certain type of matrix and then you can have like whatever positive definite matrix is a subset of a symmetric matrix and these are all, it like it's already a hierarchy in math so it kind of makes sense to make the hierarchy in code correctly and then you get the advantage of like you can have like a specialized algorithm for like a specialized matrix type but if not you can default on like the most generic type of algorithm for matrices for whatever you want to do um but again i feel like in this case it's so specific where it's like well we've already have a hierarchy because mathematics has defined this hierarchy over like 200 years of whatever mathematical development and they've decided on this versus like i don't know the example in the book where it's like here's a person here's the boss yeah. just like, oh, this seems like no you're right when in certain cases like that where there's natural mathematical uh, hierarchy like Haskell, for example, does have a concept of type classes. It's not the same kind of thing. It's more about when you can use types interchangeably. And it does have a hierarchy, but based on mathematics. And it's, it's uh, yeah. it makes sense then, but you don't have a hierarchy for like, you know, if you start making up your own hierarchies, you, you run into trouble, I think. <laughs> that's what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's how I feel for a lot of it, where it's like, if it's you not like- paint yourself into a corner, like, oh crap. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't yeah. think about this case. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I think unless it's like super, super obvious, and then it's like not yeah. worth it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was reading this as trade offs for the matrix one. It has 102 classes, 2005 methods. So, I mean, and, and like going into like other languages too. And again, I don't know Python as much as I probably should, but like that was the always the thing that you know, what's confusing me was like, you have this class, you have this method, and then it's like, and again, I know you could do functional programming in Python, I know you can do that, but that always got confusing to me, was just like, how do I know how many methods there are, and how do I know all these, you know, what to do with these methods, and then it just was like, I was yeah. like that's why I kind of naturally gravitated towards R, and again, nobody at me about this later, because it was just like, the functional <laughs> aspect of it, right, like, yeah, yeah. It was just like input output, you know, really, really simple to like, you know, grasp. And so, but that's just a, that's a naive view because I don't really use Python as much as I probably should, but, you know. Yeah, I, I feel the same. I'm, I am definitely a bit of a hater, so biased in that sense, but it's just like trying to read Python code. I'm just like, where's the actual code? It's like calling a method but then the method is not defined in this class or that class or that class or that class and i'm all of a sudden like 10 layers deep and i'm like oh i found it okay now to go back all the way back to like the original code and it's just like what is happening i'm just so confused all the time and that's probably why, why i had a false start when i first started learning it because i was still just kind of learning how r worked and everything and then i was just like it, it, it you know there's it abstracts it right some of those libraries that you use for data science it, it abstracts everything for you you just have to know what arguments to call and what methods to call and what class to use and it's just like i just was like yeah but now i have a better appreciation for it now because i understand that it, it used as a different yeah you know uses a different at least the the packages that i was using was using this paradigm because i know you could do functional programming and yeah. OOP programming in it. So, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm glad that I got introduced to S4, but I think I'm mostly going to probably stick to S3 and maybe play around with R6, but S4, unless I'm doing something with Bioconductor, which I don't ever foresee myself doing, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. then the other thing, this idea of method dispatch and like when he, when Hadley was sharing all these graphs and stuff, I was just like, yeah, <laughs> multiple dispatch, multiple inheritance. I was like, yeah, the emoji thing. I was just like, who thought this multiple dispatch was a good idea? <laughs> this is too confusing. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because I was just now reading the vignette for S7 uh, dispatch and the very last part talks about multiple dispatch. And he says, so far we've primarily focused on single dispatch i.e. generics would dispatch on as a single string, whatever. But it's possible to supply longer vector to create generic to perform multiple dispatch. It's primarily a feature of S4. How, and uh, let's see, multiple dispatch is heavily used in S4. We don't expect it to be heavily used in S7, but only occasionally <laughs> useful. So they're trying to pull yeah. back from the multiple dispatch yeah. thing. 
which I'm glad to see because I found that section of this chapter with the you know the boxes and the arrows going every which way. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, I don't have to do yeah. a little little maze, you know, puzzle here. But yeah, <laughs> and see, from the, um, the the first edition of Anstar, I think there's a lot less information in it, which I think makes it a lot clearer. <laughs> there's like less diagrams being like A one, A two, A two, A one. I was like, okay, this makes more sense to me. Like, oh. why would you need this? Why would you need, I mean, like, and I guess my question is like, why would you need multiple dispatch, multiple inheritance? Like, it just seems like it just, it just becomes a mess unless you had like a really clear design of why you would do it. I don't know. There are use cases for it. I mean, for example, Java doesn't have multiple inheritance because they felt in the early days that it was too much of a mess, right? Because again, you have to have this ambiguity about which method you mean to call. But they did introduce something called interfaces because they, although it's useful to in, perhaps inherit functionality from a parent, um, more importantly is you want to rep, to have an interface means I'm, I'm representing as I'm, I can do the same things this other thing can do. I'm not one, you know what I'm saying? I, have the, I can operate, I can, I support that interface, which is more important for Java because it's a typeful language. You have to say what type something is. So if it's something supports the interface, you can pass it to functions that can support the interface. It helps document that too. But it doesn't, it never looks in that interface your method because the interface is completely empty. It has nothing but these are the types of things I can do. And that's how Haskell mm -hmm. does it too. It has a single type class, which is not, there's no inheritance. It just says, these are the operations that I support. If I, if I, if I, um, inherit from, so to speak, this type class, then I will, I promise to provide these um, operations. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah. I think that's sort of the direction people are going more and more in that direction. Interface, interface inheritance, not implementation inheritance. That's what, if you look yeah. that up, Google that, you'll see there's a lot of uh, there's blog posts supporting this idea. Yeah. But now in a yeah. language like Python or R, you don't necessarily have to worry about implementing uh, inheriting from an interface because R is just, you know, in Python both, there's no, it's not typeful, it's not a statically typed language. So, but, you know, you just have to say, hey, this thing, you know, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. So <laughs> I promise it does. You don't have to like, you, there's no way to like reinforce that in a language, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think, can't even straight for, well, test, unit tests, right? You can do that kind of thing, but. Yeah, I think a lot of it, like just inheritance in general is the idea of like this fully, modular idealized world where like if you write a method for one class and somebody else writes a method for another class and i'm saying my class inherits from both then therefore i can use methods from two different completely two different authors and everything should work nicely um but I think in reality it gets super messy super fast like you're saying so it never yeah. like quite works out like that um, cause I don't think, I think that's the whole point of a lot of this, like, right. Encapsulation stuff, right. It's like, oh, if you have multiple authors, they can change the internals of it and they know that nobody else can access them. So it's fine. As long as they're, it was, a, it's, are... yeah, it seemed like a good idea in the early days of OOP, but like, oh, this is great. I can like define this thing and, and you know, up in the, all these other classes can reuse that same functionality. And that is a reuse is a good idea, right? You obviously want to have avoid repeating yourself right don't repeat yourself principle but i think that we're finding the better way to do that is by instead of inheriting functionality you should encapsulate by including components right in your object that you use to get that functionality yeah yeah i think a lot of it too is like like once i feel like once the problem changes enough where you're like having like three different authors and you're trying to inherit a bunch of stuff you might as well just like take a step back and just start rewriting things or like you're like actually i need this x y and z so yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well and i mean the other point of it too is is like if you're in like a package development mindset too you don't necessarily know what is going to be available in somebody's setup right because everybody's our landscape is different on their computer it's not standard across the board. So it's like, it just sounds like a dependency mess, but yeah. Hey, you have, you have the availability. It's, it's, it's built in it's functionality that you're, that you can use and rely on if you need to. But I think I'm, I think I'm going to stick to functional for now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
that's that's where I am. I just posted this Wikipedia page that kind of talks about this con- concept of composition over inheritance is the is the right oh. way to do things mostly. Sweet. All right, cool. Well, uh, I'm just checking on like what's up next. I think it's trade offs, right? And I think Ron, you said you'd take that. Yes. I would okay, take that. cool. All right, sweet. Well, then we'll we'll cover that, um, and then. I think that's pretty much the last chapter on OOP before we start jumping into meta programming stuff. So, Ooh, yeah. uh, that's, that looks crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I read like the first like introduction part of it to kind of read ahead. And it's like, this is the hardest part of this entire, of this entire book. And I'm like, great. It like, it hasn't been hard already. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go. Let's, uh, I guess time to get the power tools out and start messing with those. So, um, all right, cool. Well, I look forward to, uh, you leading this Ron next week. And then other than that, I'll see both of y'all next week. All right. See you on Monday. All right. Thanks, Tom. Have a good rest of your day. All right. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.